Welcome to Foundations of IoT. Uh, I'm the instructor, Cecil Lawson. Uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to uh, listen to uh, our webinar. I think I kind of gave a little bit of my background. Uh, I am sitting here, as many of us are, in my office at home. Uh, I've been doing that. I, I have a full-time job. Uh, right at, by the way, at 6.30, I have to initiate a public meeting, part of what I do during the daytime, um, uh, for a city. And uh, that's, just, that's just part of what I do. But I want to get into um, the course, kind of give you a back, uh, background. I'm really excited about teaching uh, this particular course. I've been doing it for quite a number of years. I've been teaching for about 21 years. Uh, and my, uh, I'm a software engineer by by trade. I, I was doing software engineering way back in the Cold War, um, launching missile systems. So I had some um, interesting, uh, interesting uh, times and events. Uh, I went into private industry, um, did a total of three IPOs and 23 startups and counting. I'm doing one right now, actually, which is in the IoT space. Um, uh, I, I have a lot of stories. I was interviewed by Stephen Jobs way back when he was alive at Next Computers. A position which I turned down. I have a different impression of most people about Steve Jobs, and uh, he, uh, but he was an interesting character in the, in our space. And certainly, I would have to attribute, and you'll see this later on, uh, the emergence of IoT to the uh, development and the deployment and the use of smartphones. And one of the so smartphones, and the difference between a dumb phone and a smartphone is a smartphone is a computer in your pocket. A regular phone back in those days was actually a phone with some kind of cool features. So there's a kind of a paradigm shift back then. We'll talk about that. All right, so let's get started with the course. I have exactly one hour and then we're gonna meet again on Thursday and we're gonna kind of uh, dig deep into the course. Um, let me just look at, there's a group chat going on. Uh, maybe some questions, uh, everyone, good. I see some taken, okay, good, all right. Um, this course, by the way, covers about eight specific areas. So. I, I, my, I'm guessing many of you are professionals. You're probably in uh, uh, maybe in a technology space, maybe not. Maybe you want to move around in the technology space. Maybe you want to move into the technology space. Um, this phenomenon, as I explained during, um, uh, during our webinar, is, has all the characteristics of what I felt and what I was involved in right around the time uh, when PCs, you know, the, the, the personal computers, which was not a word up until that point, because there was no reason for anyone to have a computer unless you were a scientist or part of the government. But it became a reason, and software chased that, and the profit chased that, and innovation chased that. And so I see all those, those combinations of things, which is why I'm excited to teach this course. We're going to be taking a narrow dive, not a deep dive, in eight areas, any one of which you may get totally excited about. For example, my background, I love databases. I always love databases. I can, I can write a, sequ a, a structured query language statement like nobody's business. It was my second job out of college was uh, working for a company called Informix, which is now part of IBM. And I cut my teeth on SQL. I had a math background, so it was totally easy for me to, to, to do it, and I loved it. And um, that is part of what we do is storing data, manipulating data, and using data. That's the value chain, the value proposition of IoT devices. All right. Let me go over some really basic housekeeping as far as our first meeting. I'm gonna show a screen here with some really basic stuff. Can you see the screen, by the way? Let me just, uh, it's just a PowerPoint slide. Let me know if, if you can't yeah. see that. Does that look okay? Can you yeah, see that? Thank you yes. very much. Yes. It's fine all right, so, all right, so this, this is me. Uh, this is the class, this is my name. If you need to send me an email, of course, I'm going to be communicating through Slack, but you, and you can send me a private email through Slack, which is going to be the platform that we use for communication. But this is my email address. If you have a question, curious about something, maybe you want to get an update or, or find out where the specs are for the Raspberry Pis, that kind of thing. Happy to, to help out. Uh, I usually uh, get to these things pretty quickly. So if you, you know, have something driving, certainly uh, send me an email. The learning platform we're going to use for this class is edX platform, which I'm really impressed with. I've used other platforms, about three of them, for, for education at three universities. But edX is one of these far-reaching platforms that has done a really good job of, uh, of organizing information to where instructors like me can sort of lay it down and you have reference to it. It does a really good job. So we're going to be using edX, and of course, that would be part of your package. Of course, I mentioned that the communications platform is Slack. 
consider Slack if you've never used it before. Slack is sort of like a, uh, like a Facebook or a LinkedIn of, of communication. It reminds me of what we used to call convert, uh, CMBC uh, content management version control systems that we use in software engineering and then content management systems that we use commercially. Uh, in the ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning space. I'm throwing a lot of acronyms out at you, but I'll keep revisiting these so you understand what I'm saying. But uh, it, it is a platform at which, uh, that facilitates communication in groups broadly, narrowly, and allows all kinds of formats of communication, including video and text and data. It's very, very good. Um, one of the things I try to, to teach, or just because I've been doing this for so long, is you're starting the course out right now at the end of this course, I'd like to be able to, to say that I hit on all of our learning outcomes. And that, that's a term that you'll find in higher education. And really all it means, let me just stop this share. really all it means is you have an expectation, you read about it, the syllabus tell, tells you what the expectation was. If you uh, were, you know, if you had the opportunity to, to look at our webinar, uh, I sort of talked about those areas that we're gonna concentrate on. At the end of this, if you find yourself at a party I don't know if it's COVID-19, if you're a party or a gathering, if you ever get that opportunity anytime soon, and someone asks you about any aspect of what we covered in this class, you should be able to answer that. We're talking about databases, we're talking about um, uh, hardware technology, we're talking about uh, Python as a programming language. Not only just what the term is, but a contextualized understanding of what it is. That's how I teach differently. Context is everything. And to give you an example of that, I mean, there's many examples of context. If you guys know the significance of the number 42, anybody know the significance of the number 42? That wants to, wants to maybe go in the, uh, the chat group to see if anybody knows. If not, I'll tell you a quick story to, to, uh, to emphasize what contextualized information is. is, is uh, it is, yes, okay. So Dan, you know. So there's a book called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, kind of a whimsical book. And there was a movie that came out like 20 years. This, the book came out in the, se the late 70s, if I recall. It was kind of a weird book, but long story short, uh, they had this huge computer and they asked the computer, what is, I think, the answer to everything? And the computer went to crunch the numbers and it took a thousand years. The estimate was, that if I get the story right, it was about a thousand years. So a thousand years passed. Everybody gathers because the computer is almost complete with uh, the answer. And then there's a big celebration, big parties, and suddenly the computer wakes up and it spits out the number 42. 42 didn't mean anything to anybody. It could have been 42 chromosomes. It could have been 42 galaxies. It could have been, it could have been anything, but it didn't have any context to it. That's one story. So what I try to do when I teach is I try to give you a story um, uh, 4, 421, oh, 40, okay. Uh, but I give you a story around things so you can put these things together and make sense of them. You may have parts of them. I suspect that most students that start out in these courses have pieces. You do have a phone in your pocket. You probably have a Bluetooth device. You're probably connected to your Wi-Fi at home right now. You're probably connected to your Wi-Fi at work. You use a network. What type of network? How fast is it? Um, and how are these IoT devices connected right now? See some of you with headphones. Well, those are connected somehow wirelessly or wired. So we're gonna talk about networks as part of all this. So at any rate, take, keep this handy. We'll post this, um, you know, just in case, not necessarily in the, I used to give out my phone number until I had students calling in the middle of the night. I do sleep from time to time. So um, we'll, we'll get that going. The other thing I wanted to take you through is sort of how edX works. So let me share this. Any questions so far, by the way? Now that you know the answer is 42 to whatever the question was. All right, good. Um, let me move on to, to the edX platform. I'm going to share another screen for you. Uh, bear with me a second. Here we go. All right, so hopefully you should be seeing the Microfactoring Institute's uh, um, uh, version of edX. There's many versions of edX, just like you probably don't know this, but there's multiple versions of Zoom. Uh, we all thought, you probably thought it was all coming out of one company. That's not necessarily two. They license, that's licensed the versions of Zoom. And I think we're using one of them right now, which is, uh, which is not the, from actually from Zoom. It's actually from another company. But so the, the, as I mentioned, um, edX is, is a very good platform. To traverse edX, uh, uh, there is a, a couple of rules that you need to understand. The general navigation, if you look at the top bar here, 
you can go backwards and forwards. Um, you can also skip around the various sections if you like. Um, so I can go from this section to this section to this section. But what I have is sort of a narrative at the beginning that explains um, how, you know, how the sections work. When you see a little video, that means the next section, if you hit that arrow, is going to be a video um, or a document, a text page, and so forth. So you'll see kind of, you'll see a pattern emerging after the first section uh, that will be very familiar in the second section. There's a video. What we like to do is, is use multimodal education, which means that I'm the talking head. I kind of explain things. I may have a couple of stories. I may have a couple of jokes. Then we show you, we take a deep dive in the, the information. And then I show you a video. So a lot of you, we know that learners uh, use their eyes and ears. Uh, some of you are tactile, which means you like to use your hands. Um, in previous courses, you know, with that opportunity, we did uh, use our hands to, to uh, connect the devices, which you will do in this opportunity with this too. We'll maybe do it together, but we'll be virtual. So anyway, so that's how you traverse through this. You'll, go, you'll start at the beginning and you'll go through all this yourselves, but I want to go over it very quickly with you. Um, so this is how you join the Zoom classroom um, uh, in the virtual classroom section of the course. So we are a virtual classroom. It's, it's just a classroom. There may be multiple classrooms, but we are the um, we are the uh, fundamentals of IOT classroom. And of course, I'm just going to take you to the next page because the first part of this course is just sort of a course overview and gives you some idea of who I am, where I came from, um, what my background is, what I've done, uh, what what the goal of the course is. The goal really of the course, and I, and I think just to a large degree, Microfactoring Institute is to fill in a gap called the skills gap. The skills gap is, in, in, in a quick summary, is yeah, you, you have a lot of education, but you really don't know anything. You ha don't have an appliable skill. Uh, and so one thing I love about IoT is not only is it a set of skills, but they're applicable to just about everywhere, including technology. Although you're here for technology, maybe to get advancement at work, maybe to open up a door for you or two. Uh, we're all here for that same reason, but we all are, we're passing skills that will be lifelong long skills that really uh, are quite interesting. Um, here's a course breakdown. Um, we cover a lot of stuff um, in, in the short period of time. We're going to be learning, uh, we're going to be introducing you to IoT. Where did it come from? What is it? Uh, is it by accident or was this something that people could have um, perhaps predicted? Um, earlier today, I was talking uh, about some of the technology that evolved from decryption and encryption uh, algorithms. And you, these things, these concepts were around for thousands of years. You can go back to ancient China where they were using encryption and decryption. Computers and semiconductors make this go much faster. And we apply that to different spaces like when you go to Amazon.com and you type HTTPS. That is what they call a public key, private key encryption mechanism. Uh, but these things evolve. So in, in many ways, um, Internet of Things is a predictable evolution of technology. Uh, and it has to do with costs. It has to do with capabilities. And it has to do with opportunities. And it's sort of a convergence of many things. We're, we're going to talk about in Section 2 SOCs, which are, which are basically called systems on a chip. SOCs are the Raspberry Pis uh, of the world. I have another one, by the way. I have... I'll show you this, and we're going to go over the Raspberry Pi in a couple of seconds. But here is a version of the Raspberry Pi. It's called Raspberry Pi Zero. You see how small that is? I had that on the slide. This is the one of the least expensive Raspberry Pis, and it has its memory is just this small card here. So not only does that use it for stored memory, but it also stores the operating system on it. The one that we're going to be using for this class is a little bit larger. And the reason why I went with the larger one, this is, this is a B plus, Raspberry Pi B plus, or in that series, I should say, is you'll, you'll see connectors that take you to your network, uh, USB, um, or HDMI connectors, full set. So you can hook this to your TV if you don't have an extra monitor to set it up, for example. But this is a Raspberry Pi uh, 3B three, uh, three plus, if I'm not mistaken. I have so many of these things, they, they, and they look somewhat similar, but they're different, um, different versions of it. We're going to talk about those SOCs, and we're going to talk about sensors. Sensors, in a nutshell, are a way that we can measure a lot of aspects of our environment. I'll show you a table that shows the different types of sensors. Now, we're all used to thermostats in our homes for temperature, 
We may be used to humidity sensors. Uh, we may be used to, you know, taking our own temperatures or looking at our heart rates, you know, if we have uh, any of the IoT devices like this one here, uh, which is an, an Apple Watch, uh, that have that capability. But there are thousands of different types of sensors that can be used for a lot of things. Uh, what we're effectively doing by putting sensors anywhere and everywhere that we can is really trying to measure uh, uh, the physical environment and abstract it uh, to, to a, a form that we can use and we can uh, have value or add value to. We're also gonna talk about actuators in here. Actuators are the things that do the work. If you think about what an actuator is, an actuator is if you have a garage door opener and you hit a button and um, uh, for example, in my car, I have a sensor that, that knows when I'm approaching my house. That sensor is a proximity sensor to my house. Once I approach my house, my garage door opens. So th something physical happens, that's actuation. And so it's an actuator. So we'll cover that in section two. Section three is an interesting deep dive in networks. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've ever talk, uh, um, taken a course in networks, you probably went over things like the OSI model, you probably went over IPv4, IPv6, you know what a difference between a local area network, a personal area network, and a wide area network is. We, we talk about switching IP address classes, um, of course, the ISO stack, uh, which is, uh, OS, I'm sorry, an ISO, OSI stack, which is very important. And some of the networking standards that are, exist and are emerging for IoT devices. One of the first problems with IoT devices is people saw this great opportunity to, uh, to put that, you know, computer capability on an IoT device, but they really didn't think out the security aspects of it. As a result, some of the early IT uh, devices were open to hacking. And of course, that's the back door to your network. It's the easiest point of get, to get into your network is to get into an unsecure IoT device. And so that's changing very quickly. I'm gonna talk about those changes. We take a, a, a little deeper dive uh, into some of the, the hardware. This is where uh, the Raspberry Pi that, uh, I'll, I'll go over that in a second, I ask you to, to get and some of the sensors and some of the wiring. We actually look at how to wire and wire it and, and how to put together a breadboard and, and make a traffic light signal out of that, an actual working IoT device. And you can preempt that any way you like. Um, one of the demonstrations that I'll show you is, uh, and you've, you've done this before, where you're at an intersection and you have to cross the street. And so you've preempted the intersection light uh, from changing by hitting a button, right? And so I put a button on the board and you can mimic that exact same uh, uh, process and we take a little deeper dive in what the Python code would look, look like take go line by line what it does and you can of course modify that to your heart's content but you will have a working IoT device at the end of this and the cool thing about the um, the Raspberry Pis which is a type of SOC by the way I'm going to show you another SOC I just got the other day that I'm experimenting with uh, this is not a Raspberry Pi it's a much smaller SOC with a microprocessor on it and it comes with the screen, it's very cool. It, it lights up and tells you all kinds of stuff. You, you need a keyboard. But and of course it has wireless capabilities. You can see that little kind of like a snake thing. That's the antenna at the back. But I just got this the other day. I'm kind of, uh, it's one of my summer projects I'm gonna play with um, because I love this stuff. All right, so we're gonna talk about the definition where these SOCs came from. We're gonna talk about processors, which made the, all this process possible, which are called ARM processors. And if you have an Apple phone, you have an ARM processor but you probably don't know what an ARM processor is, but we're gonna talk about that. And um, the other types of processors from Intel and AMC that we have in our desktop computers or our laptops and what the differences are and the different chips. So we're gonna go through that as well. We're gonna go, to, uh, many of you may be interested or have programmed. My, I'm guessing that most of you have, have taken a look and or used some programming language before. Now that's kind of my, um, my strong spot is programming because uh, if you are programmers, you're probably uh, familiar with object methodologies and you may be familiar with IBM's um, uh, product from a company called Rational Software. I worked at Rational Software and I had the unique, um, unique opportunity to proofread a gentleman named Grady Booch and Jim Rumbaugh. Now, if, if you're in software engineering, you probably know one or both of those names. They basically created the foundation for object methodologies that we use for programming today. And every time uh, before they went to press, 
um, uh, Grady Booch would send me a copy of his book with his signature and ask me to proof it. And that was, so, so I, I get to take you down not only Python, which is an OOD language, and I'll explain what that is, but um, show you the similarities between Python and other languages you may or may not have heard of, such as C Sharp, C Plus, C Plus Plus. There's a lot of C's. Uh, Ada is another one. Uh, Visual Basic is another one. Um, uh, some of the uh, Java, JavaScript. They're very similar in their constructs. So what I'm going to focus on with programming language is the basic constructs that you will find in any language. Now, the uniqueness of Python and the reason why we do Python now is because of this application to large sets of data. One of the things IoT devices do extremely well is they'll sit there night and day, 24 hours a day. They don't need breaks. They don't, they're not a part of any union. They don't need a pay increase and collect data. The question is, what do you do with that data? And this programming language, and also another programming language called R, are very good at manipulating large sets of data. And they've actually done this for real for the city of San Jose, where I went over several millions of cases of, of, um, of law enforcement cases to predict the probability of crime at a time in an area, which is quite an interesting thing if you've gone over that many records. And it, you can predict, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm here to say you actually can, to some degree of accuracy, um, the opportunities for crime. Um, and there, but there's a lot of variables. I had 30 variables just to give you an idea, but I'll explain all that. To understand the product of IoT devices, you really have to understand data and statistics. So what I do is I mix this up into one section where we talk about um, some basic statistics. Now, but I'm going to ask you, let me just get here. This is, well, I'm going to ask you in a couple minutes. My guess is for those of you who weren't math majors or don't have that proclivity, one of the worst classes you probably took was in statistics. It is very abstract. Statistics tries to use mathematics to predict what the population is doing based on sampling. There's a lot more to it. There's a central limit theorem. There's mean, median, mode, mid-range. There's uh, covariance, causality, and uh, correlation theories. And in, within the covariant theories, there are a lot of models that I've used, a few of which I've, moved, I've used to predict certain outcomes. We're not going to get into covariance, but I want to be exposed to what is it. So if someone at a party comes up to you and says, hey, I uh, was working on a covariant model the other day, you'll have an idea what they're talking about. But we do have to take a narrow dive into statistics. Not going to get too heavy, but I'm going to remind you of all, all that stuff that you maybe weren't very interested in back in high school or college uh, or even now. But we're going to parlay that or move that into understanding of data, data formats. And we're going to talk about structured data and unstructured data. And we're going to, of course, from that, that takes us into conversation about database management systems and structured query language, which is a programming language, which is, which is technically called a fourth generation programming language, because you can actually read it, kind of uh, what's going on uh, based on the query, but it's based on set theory. It's primarily based on set theory. So if you've ever taken a class in set theory, theory thinking of, you know, if you if were to imagine Venn diagrams overlapping uh, and then using De Morgan's laws and other logic theory to, to, to sort out different sets of things, uh, you're thinking about structured query language. SQL, by the way, was invented by IBM uh, many years ago, and it's really taking, uh, taken on a different direction. The other thing that I'm going to teach you about is that is the structured data world. When people are saying I'm using Oracle databases or MySQL or Microsoft Access or Microsoft SQL or any number of databases, they're really talking about structured data. Structured data takes many forms uh, that have evolved over the years. Um, we call those normalization forms. I'm going to not only familiarize you with normalization forms, how, in other words, how structured is the data, but also I'm going to uh, take a narrow dive into three-dimensional three data models, what they call data warehouses. So when you get into the cloud, we all like to look at data warehouses and why those are significant with storing data, particularly as IoT devices are gathering data. The other thing I'm going to talk to you about is unstructured data. If you've ever seen this cute little logo of a baby elephant, um, that was a logo from a, a, a technology called Hadoop. Hadoop uh, tries to make sense out of data that doesn't make any sense. It wasn't collected in a specific way. 
It's just a collection of data. Imagine a book of, of words. That's unstructured data. You can find quite a bit in the, if you were to go through a book of words, but it's not organized in a particular way. The verbs, you can pick them out, but they're not in a, in a group called verbs or nouns or adjectives and pronouns and so forth. So the reason why that is important in the world of IoT is because oftentimes to make sense of data you're gathering through IoT, you have to bring in other data sources, some of which are unstructured. Uh, and by the way, if there's always more unstructured data then there is structured data in the world. And so that's what, that's what makes this quite important. So um, you can see from the list of things that's specific uh, of what we're gonna talk about in this section. Section sev seven is um, we're gonna spend a little bit of time on data science. You see how I many, these are, these are all really interesting areas to talk about. Now data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence are often used interchangeably, and they all have a basis in one thing, by the way, general intelligence. So if you looked at the far-flung um, nightmares that, uh, that humans have had that computers will take over, that's called artificial general intelligence. That means someone's walking around that looks like a human being, talks just like a human being, but it's actually not a human being. We're not quite there yet. Where, where we are is, is, uh, is data science, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, which is synonymous with machine learning. The difference is in data science and certain versions of data science, depending on what models you use, the machine can learn, kind of learn on its own, uh, or it doesn't, that's really the main difference. And of course, as you go farther down the trail, the machine is not only ingesting information from the World Wide Web, but also from its environment making decisions. We're gonna go over all those models in data science. And really what we're trying to do in the in section six and six and seven is have you understand the, the essence of the value proposition, I guess, from IoT. It is gathering information. You make decisions. Yes, we open up your garage door when you come home. And yes, we turn on the heater or the air conditioning, conditioning based on what your preferences are. But imagine that information if a million people were doing similar things and you had access to the information. Now you can make really large decisions from that. And that's really what we're doing in these two sections. Um, again, we're gonna talk about uh, introduction to database systems. Database systems, no matter what you do in data science, data science really it, it consists of statistics, databases, and some, uh, some area of expertise, some domain expertise. And then there's a whole bunch of tools out there that you play around with. You really can't do a good job with uh, data science without, without having all three of these areas. So you may have one of them already. You may be pretty good at statistics or may have played around with databases in the past or may even have a domain expertise, but all three are very powerful. So I spend a little bit of time on SQL, some of the join logic and some of the mathematics behind SQL and database logic. Uh, so you understand how data is organized. Now, what makes all this important and, and all this possible is the natural evolution of technology as it goes into the cloud. The cloud is an interesting place in that, um, think, you know, you can thank um, your internet service providers for providing more bandwidth at less cost. Uh, now you don't have to put that extra disk drive on your computer and you can get a lot of the services uh, from uh, the cloud and IoT. But um, IoT we're going to introduce you to, we're going to talk about the layers of the cloud, such as software as a service, by the way, which is what we're doing right now with using Zoom. And I'm doing right now using edX as software as a service. We're going to be talking, talking about platform as a service and infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. Now, those are the main three, but they, they are no means the all that are out there as far as these layers of clouds. For example, UCAS, is unified communication. That's a fancy way of, of doing a phone system. You may know it as voice over IP. But these uh, technologies are emerging and getting cute acronym, acronym names. And I try to add these as fast as I can, uh, just so you know the nomenclature in an interview or at work of what's going on right now in, in industry. One of the newer terms that I'll introduce you to is fog computing which is sort of a, a hybrid of mesh computing uh, or mesh networking, which is evolved. So these are just concepts that people are playing with uh, that you need to be familiar with. So that's kind of the, um, the course um, outline and platform so far. Let me just, uh, bear with me a second, I'm just gonna bring up 
um, a couple of things. So the, the full syllabus of the course, and the important thing about the syllabus is how I grade you, if you will. So the, it, it talks about what I'm going over the course. Of course, you can click here and look at the syllabus. But at the end of the day, I have to issue a grade, and the grade is based on the syllabus. For those of you who maybe haven't taken a college course in quite some time, one of the important things to know is the syllabus is literally my contract with you. I have to adhere to the syllabus. And I, I, I t I'll tell you that throughout the course for a couple of reasons. Uh, because at, toward the end of the course, people like to negotiate their grades. And I, I have really no means to negotiate the grade because I have to provide some consistency of grading. And that is provided in a contract, so to speak, called the syllabus. The syllabus gives certain weighting to certain areas um, of, of your work. For example, your attend not your attendance necessarily, but some of the work that you do in edX. Um, you know, if you have a working IoT system and so forth. And then I basically grade based on that. And, I, and there's really no variance. I, I do take variance sometimes when I am close to a grade threshold. An example, if you are close to, if you're at 79 or 78%, but I notice that you attended quite consistently, I can push you to uh, the B, the next grade higher. I do that regularly because it tells me that you put forth some effort, um, which is important. In work, in a work environment, um, if you work hard, work consistently and you're really nice, you'll go pretty far. But if you have some actual skills that you can apply, you'll go even farther. Uh, but I try to I try to emphasize that. Showing up is, is half the battle. Um, so here's the other thing you should know is there is a pattern of learning that I have incorporated many years ago. The first thing I do, like I'm doing tonight, is I teach a new topic. So we're going to cover approximately a topic every week or so. And I'm going to I'm going to beat the topic to death. I'm going to show you videos. I'm going to talk to you about it. I'm going to have you go do the pre-learning part through edX. It's called pre-learning, where you actually take a narrow dive into the topic or ever talk about it. So you have some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so we're going to introduce I introduce a new topic. We explore the new topic, new topic using contextualized content, like I mentioned earlier, contextualized. I try to give you real examples. And I try to be somewhat personal about the examples. I've done quite a bit in my career, and I usually have a pretty good applicable example, been there, done that, that I can, I can share with you. And I always you know, solicit other examples uh, from students in the class, and that helps people kind of glom onto some of these abstract ideas oftentimes. The other thing that we instructors have to do is we have to assess how much of it you got. That's why the grade, right? Some schools, you know, don't give grades. We do give a grade. So I have to have some process of assessment, which means that at the end of the day, once I, once I introduce something and we explore and explore it and then you practice it, whatever it is, I have to somehow assess it. And that's a test. Um, and then, of course, a feedback. The grade is really the feedback loop, which means that you thought you got an A, but you got a B or a C. And maybe you're studying the wrong things. Maybe you're not. Maybe you need to talk to the instructor that's when I, I would like for you to talk to me. Send me an email saying, hey, I thought I was getting it. Maybe I'm not. I'm happy to spend extra time with you. Um, uh, it's, it's actually my pleasure. I, I, I love turning on minds, depicting this area, and we can get you going. And uh, you'll see a repeat of that from each section, each se session. And here's kind of a, a picture of how things sort of our, our work, teach, learn, assess, grade. It's just a cycle. And you have been exposed to that cycle probably most of your education careers. If you're new at this game after many years of taking hiatus from education, uh, then uh, I'll reintroduce you to it. I got a question earlier in the class about the various versions of Raspberry Pis. This is um, kind of a moving target for me. I use other SOCs, uh, but the Raspberry Pis are a tried and true uh, product. They are Re relatively inexpensive. The, the, the zero, by the way, this Raspberry Pi zero I showed you, I like to, to show you how, how cheap this is. I think it's under 20 bucks now just for the computer. And this is, in fact, a computer. It will, it will, it will run 24-7 and do something for you. And, and I showed you another one that's even smaller than the Raspberry Pi. This is a little bit more expensive um, and there are different, you know, different types of SOCs. Some, some are hardened, some are ruggedized, uh, some are, are designed to withstand certain heat uh, and sensitivity and so forth. But for this class, um, you need to acquire um, an electronic basic 
a, a basic kit with power supply module, breadboard, jumper wire. Let me grab one of these and show you kind of what they look like. Here's, here's a version of one. It's just a kit. You're, you're going to use this a lot. You're going to use this in all the classes. But this is what it, it looks like. And it comes with, you know, if I open this up, comes with a, a breadboard. This is, it's much more organized than this. You can see, uh, kind of I'll tilt this a little bit. You have resistors. If you don't know what those are, you will. It has transistors. It has LED lights. It has a breadboard, which is how you cross connect these things. And it has various wires. It also has a power supply, kind of a distribution unit that you use for the breadboards. I'll show you how to use that during one of our classes. Uh, but that's about $12.99. By the way, when you buy that, this is not what, is, what I call a one trick pony. You're going to continue to use that if you take interest in that. It's going to be quite useful. I have about four of these over in my corner, my office that I use quite often. Uh, I'm building a, a summer project and I, I use a couple of the wires from that as well. The Raspberry Pi I selected is the Raspberry Pi 3 Plus with the power supply. Now, technically, you can supply the Raspberry Pi power from your computer if you have a connector. It uses a, a mini USB. It's uh, right there. Technically. Uh, oh, sorry, right here. It says the mini USB. So I can, I can hook this up to my computer. And it's going to get about five volts from my computer, and that'll work. But the kit, and so if you wanted to save a buck or two, you can go ahead and get just the Raspberry Pi 3 Plus. It, it's up to you. I get questions from time to time. I think even before the class, if you already have a Raspberry Pi, will it work? Probably. Um, Raspberry Pis have evolved. The technology has evolved in different ways. Uh, most, most of the evolution of the technology is with speed and form factor. Form factor being the size, the shape, and of course the speed, the type of processor, the ARM processor that they're using uh, in there. And of course those get a little bit more expensive. This one is going to be pretty robust, which means this is going to, if you continue in your path through IoT, uh, through the other courses and maybe beyond, this is going to last you a while. You're going to be using this for sure. Um, if I gave you the Raspberry Pi Zero, the smaller one, it's kind of a one trick pony. It's somewhat limited. Uh, you can only extend its memory size. Um, the processor is really dog slow if you're, if you're starting to program on it. For example, we're going to be doing our Python programming on the Raspberry Pi. So I recommend this. That kit is about 52 bucks. Um, the memory, I go back and forth about the memory. We, again, at the beginning of the class, we had a conversation about the memory. I recommend, originally, I recommended 64 gigs. 32 is plenty. And um, my peers in, in the other two courses are, are also going with a consistency of 32 gigs. We don't believe we're going to use more than that. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you have a couple extra dollars in your, in your pocket and you plan on using this for other courses or other things, more is merrier. Uh, every, every SOC I have here has at least 64, if not 128. You get into some addressing as you set up these SOCs. You get into some addressing issues. You know, I've got a couple chats going on here. Addressing um, issues, um, uh, which is the formatting of, of the, the memory for this. Um, and there's different, there's FAT, there's, um, there's FAT32, I think, and there's a couple other versions just for addressing of the memory. Uh, I'm just going to, oh, there's a one question. I tried the 65 gigabyte uh, SDHC card. It works, but the Pi only could use, yeah, 32 gigs. Uh, had to format another EXT4 partition, which is the Pi could use. I, I believe the Pi, if I'm not mistaken, has multiple formatting, or there are multiple formatting options when you format the, um, the uh, SD card uh, for addressability. But I can't be for sure, but for sure, check the Raspberry Pi page, it'll tell you exactly. So that's a good, uh, Jim, thanks for that. Um, um, the other thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be interfacing that Raspberry Pi on a breadboard. We're going to power it up. You're going to make a real IoT device, and we're going to be using some of the sensors that we talked about. Um, air pressure, temperature, humidity, lighting, and so forth. And that's $21.99. We'll use a couple of the sensors, but I want you to... Uh, what, what I'm really trying to demonstrate for you is the ability to read information from a sensor, whether that be temperature or air pressure, um, and then store that information, get that information away, and then make some decision. For example, um, I had um, a temperature, I used a temperature sensor that would turn on a red light if it got beyond a certain temperature, and then a yellow light, and then a green light. Silly little things like that, programmatically, 
working with the environment around you to make some decisions. You can, you can just as, simple, as easily launch a missile with this type of technology. But I want to get you at least familiar with um, how environmental changes could cause actions uh, with this part of it. So we're going we're gonna, to, um, this is the hardware set that we need uh, for the class. Um, any, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at my group chat right now. Any questions about that outside of there, there seems to be some challenges uh, with some of the larger, uh, you know, I, I, be safe, go with the 32. I think you'll be okay. If, even if you're taking two or even three of our IOT classes this summer, I think that's a safe bet. All right. Any questions at all about that? Uh, GPI has been taken off the requirement list and uh, I ordered one, so mine is on the way, but uh, you can get them before the class is over. Oh, the, the which, the, the pies? Are no, the last one, the, the GPI, that uh, oh. sensor. But okay. if you're participating in the other class, uh, IoT for work, life, and play, life, yeah. you, you, you are supposed to order, uh, I think, a temperature sensor and a humidity sensor, but, but, but from Arduo, or no, Adano or something like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe that can be used. I don't know. Yeah, the only difference, so you, technically you could, but those sensors that are used for their other Pi are using a Zigbee interface. So these sensors will plug directly into a breadboard. Um, could you use them? Yes, if you had, if you bought a, a, a Zigbee reader, but of course you'd programmatically, it, it adds a complexity to the class that in this particular, in the foundations class, it kind of defeats the purpose, uh, which means you're gonna be writing code to interpret the Zigbee, almost like a Bluetooth interface if you, I'm gonna use, it's, it's just another version, another um, uh, protocol. So to avoid that, uh, I went with some very basic sensors. You know, if, if we're having a hard time finding this, we could find uh, just a couple other, you know, it, it, maybe week, week two, later on Thursday, I'll ask if anybody's having a hard time finding this package of sensors. Uh, if so, then we can pair some of the, the um, sensors out um, and um, get some specific sensors. Just so, just again, so you can look at the environment, make a decision, environment meaning Look at the humidity, look at the temperature, look at any number of things, and, and then read that information and make, uh, make some decisions. But the, yeah, the sensors between the courses are quite different because we're using dis different objectives. Mine is to introduce you to programming uh, to hardware. Uh, they have a different objective than the other one, but very similar in nature. But hardware a little bit different. All right. Any other questions uh, before I move on? Oh. Uh, yes, I, yeah, have, I, I have a question. Um, sure. So. Will all of these devices work on a Mac computer? The Raspi, so uh, yes, um, we, we've had, I've had many classes where a Mac was used, a PC was used, even uh, I have, this is, this is the Amazon Fire, by the way, it, it, you can use that as well. The, the key is going to be, uh, and someone asked about what the operating system is, the, which Pylos, uh, we're going to be use uh, Noobs, Raspbian, I recommend news because it's easier to, to load. You can actually get it preloaded if you want to spend a couple extra bucks. But the Raspbian operating system is what we'll be, what we'll be using. There are other operating systems um, available, but Raspbian is free. It does the job, and it has some really cool development tools on there that just you just click and you start going. So it, it makes it quite easy. Um, uh, okay, so it looks like Jim looks like he has 29. Jim said that he loaded on a 32 gig. He had about 29 free. That's plenty, Jim. So the 32 looks like is a good size uh, for what we're doing in this class and probably for the other classes. Thanks for that, Jim. Um, and so the, I'm sorry, the, the, the last question was uh, where to work on a Mac. And uh, the, the Mac, it, it's the operating system the way you get to the, the, uh, the operating system is um, through uh, either a wired or wireless connection. So there's third party uh, software that allow you to abstract the underlying oper the Mac OS operating system or the Windows 10 operating system away. So not, no problem at all, I'll help you through that. There's really, once you connect wirelessly to the Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi, there's really no difference if you're on a PC or any other device. So it's uh, quite easy, so it does work. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. That helps. You bet. Uh, let me go to the next page. So that's what you need. And that's, of course, this, this, all this text I'm reading is, is right on edX. Uh, how can I take this course? Um, 
Oh, here we go. Reach out. I, you know, we're just starting the course today. If you know anybody who would like to take the course, the more the merrier, or would benefit from a, a narrow dive in eight different areas, uh, maybe just to explore, to see something, you know, maybe a career is ahead of them. We're hoping that that is. But reach out. Um, uh, and if, you, if you're curious and maybe have a, 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 want to be an instructor, uh, you know, we'd like to hear from you. If, if this is interesting for you, if you just take to this like fish to water, uh, we'd like to talk to you about it. Um, and uh, we'll always keep you updated on any new offerings. One of the things Microfactoring Institute tries to do is to be on the cusp of new technologies as they are emerging, but more, uh, more critically, as they are validated. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of technologies that seem like they were pretty cool, but nothing happens. I'm thinking of, um, uh, uh, for example, uh, 3D printers. I mean, I mean Hewlett Packard years ago put a lot of money in 3D printing and it just didn't, didn't pan out the way. Does it mean it's not viable? No. It may be viable in the future, but certainly not at the time that they thought. IoT for sure, and uh, we're going to be developing other courses that are right on the cusp um, of, the tech, of technology as people are beginning to hire or beginning to open up the floodgates of hiring. So keep, um, keep posted on that, and we'll certainly let you know about any of that. Okay, let's keep, keep going here. Okay, your first assignment. All right, here we go at the end. So I have a hard stop at exactly 6.30. We have about um, uh, 14 more minutes. Let me just show you this quick video I did. Uh, um, it's kind of a cute little video, but it, it begs a question uh, at the end of it. And I want you to focus on the question. Here we go. There are nearly 8 billion of us on the planet today, but 70 billion IoT devices that are already connected to the internet. We seem to use them for just about everything. Our health, our fitness, they help us sleep at night, wake up in the morning, get to work, come back home. Our doctors use them, our educators use them. They're just about everywhere. But how did we get to 70 billion devices so quickly? What phenomenon occurred about 20 years ago that caused this to happen? Well, there's three technologies that really made IoT available, one of which you use every day. Want to guess what that technology is? So this begged a question for you, um, and I want you to go to, just so we all get used to this, the group chat, and I want you to think what that tech, I gave, kind of gave you a hint earlier when I started the class, what exactly is the technology that caught this whole field on fire? Start typing away. What do you think it is? Come on, type away. All right. Okay. Internet. Yeah, close. It good. Smartphones, semiconductors. iPine? I don't know what that is. I, oh, iPhone. That's what, okay. Smartphone, iPhone. Wow, you guys are going. Okay. So, wow. Give me a SOCs. You're all right. Uh, you were a uh, keep uh, internet. Yeah. It, you know, it's there's a theory. Keep going, guys. Smartphone. You guys are getting it all right. I, ha I, I don't see one wrong answer. Um, perfect. Okay, so there's a theory in history. There's two historians go into two groups. One group of historians believe there's what they call the big man theory. Um, what they call historical arsonists come on the scene and they change everything. Actuators, that's true too. Everything. Yeah, connection. Yeah, there you go. Boy, data science. Oh, you keep going. So these are people like uh, 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 I don't know, uh, uh, Adolf Hitler or um, uh, Albert Einstein, these people that come on and then they fundamentally change, uh, Stephen Jobs fundamentally change things. So these are the people that we have studied through history uh, throughout the world. They are historical arsonists. What they do is they burn down old things and they, we renew them with new things. That's one theory. The other theory is we naturally evolved to the point where a conglomeration of things happen and somebody notices it, right? They said, wait a minute, huh? I have the internet, you guys just hit on it and I have semiconductors, semiconductors are getting cheaper and faster, internet's getting cheaper and faster, hmm, what can I do? 
an interesting story. If you've ever read about Netflix, there were two founders of Netflix. The one founder, Reed Hastings, still CEO of the company. Um, and I know a little bit about Reed because one of my best friends is a senior vice president there in charge of HR. And uh, she talks about him all the time. He's quite a character. Reed Hastings, he noticed that bandwidth, the available of the in internet, was getting faster and cheaper, and that was being driven by demand. When people want something, we all, what they call in marketing, uh, race to the bottom, produce better, faster, less expensive if we can. So as a result, bandwidth was exponentially, and that's probably exaggeration, growing, and the costs were either love, not growing as fast, which means it was affordable to most, and I had an opportunity um, many years ago to work on a project at the White House that was trying to close this uh, gap that was being created between those who could not afford a computer and those advantages they would receive by having a computer and those who did not have a computer. There was a big gap that was forming and our goal was to close that gap because we saw the writing on the wall, which means and it's happened, everybody's using computers, right? Even if you don't think you have a computer and you're using a phone, you do have a computer in your pocket. From what I can tell, the, the flashpoint for this, and by the way, Reed Hastings, going back to Reed, noticed there is a correlation between certain technologies. He surmised that in a few years, the quality of video streaming that was available on the internet would be that of which you would see in a movie theater. So Netflix was created. Uh, I, uh, bear, bear with me just one second. This is uh, the mayor. <laughs> hey, Brian. Uh, no, um, I'm actually online with the class. That's okay. Okay, bear with me. Let me, let me start the meeting. Just one second. My apologies. One of the things I do is I work for a city. And so what I'm starting is a public meeting. So give me about 30 seconds and I'll start right back up. There it goes, okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I conduct public meetings as part of uh, COVID-19, and so we have to make sure that all meetings uh, are public and accessible by the public, and so I just had a bit of a conflict in about five minutes, so. Uh, but Reed Hastings noticed this correlation of the streaming happening and the quality of video. At one point, by the way, just so you know this, if you've ever gone to Blockbuster Video, and bought a video, Reed Hastings went to Blockbuster and asked if they would buy the company because he was having some cash flow issues. Long story short, they said no, Blockbuster no longer exists. So again, those two groups of theories, I think what we're seeing is a natural evolution, but the big man on the spot that really started this was Steve Jobs because Steve had a vision of putting a computer in, the po in your pocket and that created great opportunities, including the drive for profits, which of course technology and innovation comes from. Others, uh, by the way, many of you said disruptors, absolutely. The, the very nature of this technology is disruptive. Everything you can think of that you use today can be disrupted by IoT. That's why you need to be part of it uh, because that's where the market will be growing. Okay, um, here's your first assignment. Uh, your first assignment, navigate this, this, this Slack classroom in the next section and follow the instructions and complete the introductions. Okay, so your job before we meet on Thursday is to go on the Slack, kind of discover what it is, and maybe say hello to a couple people. There's, there's one assignment I want you to talk about, which is, is, let me see if it can come up here. There it is. What's your name? Where are you from? Take a look at the course content. Kind of get familiar with the course, get familiar with Slack, and then we're really going to hit it really hard on Thursday. We're going to start in the actual, um, uh, very good. Ron's already done it. Very good. Ron, you're on top of it. Um, and then one of the first assignments is 
you know, do you think um, a electric car or like a Tesla or as many electric cars out there is an IoT device? Something to think about. I know many of you have, have, have answered those questions. Um, uh, Separate others are there too. Very good. All right, you guys are on top of it. All right, then been there, done that. Okay, and then I want you to keep moving. So the next, moving through the course, and let me just let my page refresh. refresh. Um, here's the Zoom classroom. Everything that we do here will be recorded. If you have to leave early, come late, uh, or can't make it, uh, this whole thing will be recorded and be available through the Zoom classroom, just FYI, which is really cool. Uh, okay, but, uh, all right, guys, I have to, I have to uh, go now. Any questions before I, I leave you to and see you on Thursday? At all? Oh, very good. Thank you, Matt. By the way, um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or go to Slack, and we'll, uh, we'll take care of it then. All right. I apologize. I have to leave a, a couple minute, a minute or two early because I have a public meeting to conduct, but um, uh, certainly, I look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday where we really start hitting the content and uh, talking about this exciting area. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, contact me uh, through, uh, through um, uh, email or um, through Slack. Have a great evening, everyone. We'll see you on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Bet. Thank you. You bet. Have a great evening.